Alan Steinfeld, host of New Realities TV and the author of his brand new book, Making Contact, Preparing for the New Realities of Extraterrestrial Existence. Hello, I am Suzanne Ross, and I am so delighted to bring you this interview with my friend, Alan Steinfeld. The introduction yes. to your book is incredibly prophetic, and oh, you, I have goosebumps just saying that. It's oh. profound on many levels, and oh. you really relate the need for us to connect with these advanced otherworldly beings in order to evolve our own species at this time with free energy technology, whatever they might be able to offer and share with humanity during this tumultuous time, this time of a great positive shift. And so I just, and you bring in the history and the illuminaries that you've interviewed over the years and your own UFO research and experiences. And I just wanna say the introduction is incredibly well-written. And then of course you go into these essays with people who have done, who are famous for their you know, UFO. I I so much appreciate you saying that because I it took me six months to write that. It's like, how am I going to package 75 years worth of history and 200,000 years of human civilization? And and I just I didn't quite channel it, but it sort of like came in pieces and it was just it was trying to translate a kind of abstract awareness into words that could be easily read and understood. And that opening quote, do you remember the opening quote I have? Do you have the book there with you now? I, I have, actually have it on uh, Kindle, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that opening quote of the introduction, I was saving that for 20 years. Did you want to read yeah, that opening sure. quote? Because that's like my favorite part of the book. And it's written by an abolitionist in 1844. And I thought, well, this is so contemporary. So yeah, read that because I think that readers will get a sense of where I'm coming from. There are seasons in human affairs of inward and outward revolution when new depths seem to be broken up in the soul, when new wants are unfolded in multitudes and a new and undefined good is thirsted for. There are periods when the principles of experience need to be modified, when hope and trust and instinct claim a share in the guidance of affairs, when in truth to dare is the highest wisdom, William Ellery Channing, the union. Yes, the union, 1844. Doesn't that sum up where we are now? Like. <laughs> I, I actually get emotional hearing you that. And I've read it. But I know. <laughs> because to dare is the, I mean, that line just caught me. To dare is the highest wisdom. This is why we're out in front, me and you and a bunch of other people talking about this. It's like, this is the future. This is, you know, this is, it's, it's beyond survival, but we, it, it puts us in a realm that transcends the past, which was about survival, you know? Yes. We need to transcend survival in order to survive. That's my thesis. Ah, beautiful. I just get this image of moving into the higher chakras, my, my picture behind me, right? We've been stuck yeah. in these lower chakras. And I do believe that these chakras represent dimensional stages of evolutionary development. And we've been stuck in this like third chakra. And I feel that this fourth dimension is all about moving into the heart. And here's the gateway 
between the lower and upper chakras and communication or making contact, right, is in the fifth chakra, this fifth age that the indigenous say we're moving into. Yes, it is a fifth chakra thing. We're learning to develop the divine voice, the divine communication, the thing that expand that's how we make contact with each other right making contact is our connection to to humans to humanity and beyond and so you're right it's a fifth chakra experience we're going into and so. speaking of communication can you explain the symbol of the asterisk between making and contact on your book? <laughs> you know, I'm so, so happy you asked that question because I've been waiting to answer that question because the asterisk, it's like a little star. It is the point of making contact, the star, that, that abstract place of awareness between making and contact. There's a point that you see symbols are undefinable within words and my thesis and theory is that these beings don't communicate to us in words they communicate to us in um what do linguistics call a cluster of meanings like like emojis if i give you a thumbs up it's like does that mean yes does that mean I'm happy. Does that mean I'm with you? It means all those things. So this is sort of my understanding of how they communicate with us, not in the concretized understanding of words and this, this means that because they are much more abstracted beings. You know, the abstraction is a sign of greater intelligence. This is why humans have survived over many animals because we've been able to think abstractly. What's over that mountain? What if we make fire here? What if animals are great, but they're instinctual? They don't necessarily have the ability to think abstractly because they're so present within the environment. So they don't make plans. Yeah, maybe they make nests and all that, but that's so, still instinctual. We have the ability to think in these higher realms, but then we still concretize things into, I know what this means and this, and, and you call something a tree and then you think you know what it is because you called it that, but trees are incredible beings. They're not one thing. And so the more we live into abstract awareness, the greater the cluster of meanings we can access from the universe, the more our right brain, which is a pattern seeking um, part of ourselves, you know, left brain is very linear, right brain is intuitive, it's the feminine, it's the receptive, and they, that right brain sees patterns. Patterns are what symbols are. You recognize the asterisk, it's a little star, it means something, but what does that mean? It means something different, but it also means something the same. I, I describe it for me. I had to put some abstract language right in the title because I wanted that communication immediately to be, I can't say understood, but apprehended by the reader. You see, there's a difference between apprehension and comprehension. There's a difference between wave forms and collapsing the wave. You know what that means in physics? When Yes, right? these are waves until a conscious observer looks at them and only then do they become particles of form. That's right. And when they become particles of form, they are no longer anything else. I'm saying it's this and that is what it is. But quantum computers talk about superposition. So it's superposition is, let's say you have a set of dice in your hands. I sort of developed this in Las Vegas, this idea. And you roll the dice, it lands, you've collapsed the wave function into seven or 11 or eight. But before the dice land, when you're rolling them, an infinite or at least 36 different potentials exists. So supercomputers calculate 
the probabilities and not the results. And it gives them, these computers, a lot more information because life is always changing. Life is always moving. There is no ultimate collapse of the wave function. Everything is in superposition if we understood how to use our minds to wormhole our way through reality. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> so I say, you know, words make us comprehend, but symbols make us apprehend. Mm -hmm. Apprehension, people use apprehension in a sort of negative way, they're apprehensive, but it just means the form has not been solidified and exists in many levels at once. Mm -hmm. This is apprehension. When you apprehend or sense or intuit, you're sensing the greater reality of potentiality. Mm -hmm. And this is how I believe from my context experience, the ETs think and function and use their technology and use their minds and interact with people through an abstract expression, abstract knowing. Abstr and, and if we can tap out of the realm of knowing into not knowing, into freedom from the known, like Krishnamurti says, Krishnamurti says, the great you know, Hindu um, philosopher says, true freedom is freedom from the known. If we can start to live in the unknown, in the abstract, and without you know, collapsing the wave function, we'll be closer to where and how these ETs exist on their level of awareness. Does it reminds me of the law of one books, right? When they were channeling Group Ra and Group Ra kept referring to this potential possibilities vortex, right? Yeah. And so they would ask questions about the future and they would say, well, based on <laughs> the possibility probability vortex, then this is a set of things that may happen. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, that is what happens. And so it's like the infinite space is passing through this moment, this pinpole moment of time. And then it's like out again into the infinite. So all we have is this moment. And if we could stay abstract in this moment, not just me and you, but everyone listening, then anything is possible. Then timelines change. We can shift the timeline reality potential of the human being into infinite forms of consciousness. This is what the hope, I think, of meeting, of making contact holds for us, you know? So that asterisk, not to go too on too long about that one little thing, but that is the whole book, in a sense. That asterisk is the point of contact. It's the point and the point of contact. You know? Beautifully expressed. It's the message yes. of contact and it is the actual actualization. If we can apprehend its intent, we are making contact. Beautiful. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm glad you get that because I can't really talk to a lot of people about that because they say, what are you talking about that? But you get it because you're sort of, you're an artist and you're thinking abstract. Artists think abstractly. They think because in those realms where they kind of float through the concretized realities and create something that holds uh, manifold aspects of meaning. Mm -hmm. So since you're an artist and a creator, you, you understand that, but a lot of people actually don't, which is okay. They've just been so programmed into left brain thinking, like, come on, tell me what you mean. What are you talking about? And I'm saying, I'm not talking about anything. I'm talking about everything. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm also really right. into quantum physics and how exactly. they describe the universe, the reality being made of information. And what is information? 
symbols that have meaning. And this entire wow. reality being a representation of a geometric language, a reflection. Now they're talking about an E8 crystal or E8 lattice, this spherical yes. geometric mandala made of different combinations of tetrahedrons that is being projected from the eighth dimension into the fourth wow. dimension to derive 3D. And the math is right. in the mandala, which I like because if you think of the matrix, you just think of binary code running and that's not very sexy, right? <laughs> but when you think that it's truly symbols, these geometric patterns, that are defining our reality. Of course, it makes us think of the platonic solids and the tetrahedron being the most fundamental form, but there, it's a geometric language of symbolism that gives our universe meaning. Right, it gives it meaning in an abstract way, these symbols, the geometries, and there is concretized applications of Geom geometry, which is, I think, how these UFO craft work through actualizing a potentiality of the abstract movement and saying, okay, we're going to collapse the wave function in this way at this moment, and then you move from place to place. But living in that um, wave function you can get anywhere at any time with anyone you want, sort of, you know, because so this is why they're also not showing up because they want us, not that I have it figured out, but they want us to figure this out so we can meet them on an even playing field. It's like, I, I equate it to like talking to your dog, you know, if you're trying to communicate with them, you're not going to bark at them because <laughs> well sometimes i do <laughs> sometimes you do but and they really might get my that, dog out. <laughs> but, but dogs um maybe or a monkey or whatever there's and not to judge them but the lower form of consciousness and they we're speaking a more evolved language just like dolphins are speaking a more evolved language than us you know dolphins can can make four sounds at once we are stuck with the blah, 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 at a time, one word. And they can make a sound through their blowhole, through their nostril, through their throat, through the, the back of their mouth at once. At, so they are living and their brains, if you look at a dolphin brain, they're much more complex and sophisticated. They never sleep either. They are, they sleep on one side of their brain at a time. And John Lilly just, Discovered this when he would anesthetize a dolphin thing. Oh, they're mammals. They, they, they sleep and no, they drowned. When they were fully anesthetized, those dolphins were, did not come up for air and they drowned. So a dolphin sleeps on half their brain at once, their right side and their left, because they are conscious breathers. And of course, you know, the power of breath, the power of rebirthing and breathing. So I'm saying the more sophisticated the intelligence, the more abstract their awareness. That's my opinion. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, totally following that and your descriptions good. have really been very well expressed. And so totally getting mm. that theory. And I'm sure the viewers are as well. And so, right, so let's, my next book, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say my next book is going to be about art and UFOs. So yeah. Okay. Ah. What were you going to what Wonderful. are you going to say? And yeah. so let's dive into the content of your book and start with your first essay, which is Nick Pope. Uh, the, mm. He once was a UK de, uh, Ministry of Defense, right? Yes. And you know Nick, right? You, you I do know Nick. Nick. Yes, I've met him at Contact in the Desert events. Yes. <laughs> That's right. So do, did you get the way I structured the book? Did you understand the sequencing of the... Like, what did you understand about right. that? And so for me, it felt like you were starting with the nuts and bolts with Nick. Yes. Pope. 
right? Yes. yes. And then you exactly. were building on that into then consciousness and how it affects yes. the consciousness. And, you know, what was really struck me about the book and something that I've said for years is like, Okay, yes, they're there. There's a craft, there's a craft, here's a photo, you know. I get it. And then we've known this for decades. Who's on the craft? Where are they from? Why are they here? How has human evolution been affected by their intervention? Do we have starseed origins? Are we are they our ancestors? Like the deeper questions, and ultimately the question not many people explore that you do in in great detail, Alan, and bless you for this, is how it shifts someone's consciousness at a cognitive mm. level in a profound yeah. way. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. At a cognitive level is the shift we need to make. This is what distinguishes an evolving civilization is if we can make a cognitive adjustment about our view of reality. So, you know, people living in caves had a very particular view. They may have been more conscious of the abstract and the awareness, but, you know, I think evolution of culture is the expansion of cognitive awareness. That's why I call my program New Realities because it's a new reality. So that's the sequential development in the book. Nick Pope, he's a great guy, very smart, but he is just looking at the situation from the disclosure angle, the government cover up, the, the hardware, the nuts and bolts. That's in a way all he's concerned with. And if other things exist out there and abductions or starseed, in a way that's not his concern. I mean, it's not his lens of focus. So I thought that's where we're all starting from in a way. That's where, you know, what's the government knowing? Why aren't they telling us this? What's really going on? I needed that insider's point of view as kind of, start us all off on an even playing field because that's something everyone relates to before we get into the really deeper ET presence and abductions and all that. So if we could start out together, <laughs> right? And, and you know, this didn't even come to me, the sequence until I actually asked Nick to contribute. I was, I was thinking I was going to make this kind of all spiritual and new age. And, but, you know, it just keep coming back to me. I know Nick, I could reach out, I could ask him. And when he said, yeah, he'd love to contribute. It's like, oh, I can arrange this and a vertical access, you know, where we go from the exo, the exterior right. yeah. to the interior, to the deep interior. So yeah, Nick says, well, this is why government doesn't want to reveal their secrets. They don't want to share technology. They don't want to freak out people. They know all the things we know, but some really hardcore evidence of the, of the things that they're doing to stop disclosure, you know? He calls himself, actually, it was a great opening line. He, remember, what? can you read the opening line to Nick's? I mean, because I love when you read because you have such a good voice too for reading that. And Thank you. Just, you okay, hey, let me you just know. go to Nick oh. Pope's section here. Oh, right, right. Table of contents. Oh, if you had the book, you should, I'll get you the book next time I see you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm on the chapter, Government Mindset and Our Future Among the Stars. Yes. What does he say? What's the first sentence he says there? Every story what? needs a villain. When it comes to the story <laughs> of UFOs, the role of that villain is usually taken by the government. In this story, the government is sometimes seen as a single monolithic entity, while other times there's a suggestion that some sort of cabal exists within the government managing UFO secrets. Right. So, you know, there's two sides to this UFO story. There's the defense, the defense department, those covering up, and there's the offensive side. These beings are showing these ships. So it's like, and the people in the UFO 
business or world are always dealing with these two was dealing with the government. What do they know? And what do the ETs want to show us? And then, you know, there's like I say in this book, in the next chapter with Grant Cameron, there's no innocent bystanders. You know, if you've seen a UFO, according to Grant, you were meant to see it. You are part, I don't say of the problem, you are part of the situation. You are part of the phenomena. You, you're one of us. If, and, and he, according to him anyway, there are no chance sightings because they're aware of this. And it goes back to quantum physics again. You know, consciousness has energy. If you're looking at a craft, that craft is looking at you. Somehow it's aware. Quantum and entanglement, right? Especially exactly. if they're our ancestors. Exactly. And that entanglement, once you've seen a craft, that's with you. You're, you're, you're entangled and that entanglement doesn't go away. Right. So, and that actually sightings are also increasing around the world. So entanglement is getting more entangled, you know? Yes. I just talked to a UFO researcher in China where it's not safe to be a UFO researcher, but she said to me, Xiao Ma, she said more and more people are reporting to her about this phenomenon, about having dreams, about seeing things. So mm -hmm. people here in this country think it's just about the US. No, this is a worldwide phenomenon. This is, this is, this is for everyone. This is a changing of the guard, of the God, of the change in time, of space. This is a, a shift in the modality of thought. It's, it, it, is a, it is a threshold into a new world. It really is an aspect of something more that's been latent within our cognitive structures has to come online and be accessed. It's like what Joe Dispenza says, you know, Joe's work. Joe yes, Dispenza. Sure. Mm -hmm. He says, we need new neural nets of creation. If we're going to have a new life, we need to put together the vast capabilities of the unknown and think in different ways. If we're going to access the divine God part of us, because we're not accessing it in the old mind. So the new neural nets of actuality exist in new thoughts that don't make sense to the old way of being. But as we push into the unknown, you know, it's the story of the caterpillar. He never expects to be the butterfly. The caterpillar is just eating green leaves, but, and would not even recognize the butterfly as itself. If it was to see it, I'm just projecting my thing onto the caterpillar, but this is what we're becoming. We are, you know, destroying our environment, eating all the green leaves and, we go into these cocoons. We've just been in a cocoon for like the last two years. And that's been part of our change because we are becoming a new species. We're becoming a new humanity, a new- and, Right? Yeah. yeah. And as yeah, we do, definitely. expanding our mind. And you talk about a neural network, which I think is fascinating yeah. because there's cognitive brain scientists and quantum physicists yeah. alike who are recognizing the expanse of multidimensional realities as an interconnected neural network. And for me, exactly. after my missing time experience, I was able to expand my mind throughout that neural network. Well, why and don't you tell us what happened to you in your missing time? I'd love to hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, it kind of started before I was born. Just in brief, my father had a missing time experience when he was 18 years old, living in a small town of Leader, Saskatchewan. And he was 18, him and three of his buddies took off down a dirt road after dinner one night. And they noticed a bright white light in front of them, behind them, out in the field. And so my father pulled over to get out and lean against the driver's side door with his buddy Don to see if this thing would pass him on the road. The other two guys were screaming to get the hell out of there. 
<laughs> the next thing they knew, they were all sitting in their car and they saw this bright white light speed across the field, merge with a larger orange light and take off into space. And so they went to the nearest farmhouse, started banging on the door, and the woman was furious that they were knocking on her door after midnight. They were shocked that it was after midnight. They were stunned as to what happened to four hours of their time. Speechless, they drove back home. The next day, my father recognized he had a triangular shaped metallic object wow. in his wrist. And when we were that... old enough to not be- Wait, what year was this story, that it happened with your father? What was the year for your father's uh, my father was born in 1936, and so it was when he was 18 years old. That was 54. It was in the 50s. That uh, So anyway, continue the story. Sorry, I was just curious. Yeah, no worries, right? In the 50s. Nope. And then, Alan, yeah. so when we were growing up, he would hold this thing, and it looked like a slightly raised gray object on his wrist. It was and still in him. He never, it was, he lived with that object. He lived with that object his entire wow. life. And shortly wow. after this incident, now, mind you, he grew up in this little tiny town of leader. He was then recruited by national cash register company, NCR. And mm -hmm. then after he met my mom date in Ohio, yeah, they were moved <laughs> to Mount Shasta where I was born. And oh, then, you were born in Mount Shasta. That's was, cosmic, isn't it? Right. I was a very psychic uh -huh. little kid. I had lots of invisible friends. And but, but, <laughs> so what happened then? So he was moved after the thing was implanted in him. He was moved, but he was hired by National mm -hmm. NCR. Yeah. Right. And then and, married my mom. And then they were, and then they had my sister. And then they were moved to Mount Shasta, where my father worked at, in Reading. And then about three years after that, he was moved to Dayton, Ohio, where the headquarters right. of NCR are, right. right near Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Oh, now, I, and that was the base. Right. That was where the Roswell was taken, every, at Roswell crash. Yeah, go ahead, continue, yes. My Amen. father was German speaking, his mother right. was German, and on Sunday nights, where we lived in West Carrollton, Ohio, he would have these German men come over and my mother would usher us into the back bedrooms while him and these German men would pour over these plans and speak in German. And, you know, I had no idea, of course, at the time I was just a little kid, but my father was secretive about his work. But as a kid, he was always pointing up into the sky, explaining the three belt stars of Orion, Pleiades is a star nebula, and odd things happened. Lights would Wait, do you think he really dark. worked? Do you think he really worked for National Cast Register? Or do you think that was a cover for not saying where he really did work? I think national cash register company with their computer technology was intricately involved with what was going on at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. You know, I think you're right because I have a friend whose mother is part of Patter Patterson and the Pattersons somehow were connected to national cash register. There is, I'll ask my friend Molly, cause she, Definitely, there is a connection. You're right. I never put that together, but there is a national. There, I think the Pattersons may have started National Cast Register. And wow. of course, Patterson, something like that. I don't know if that's actually yeah. true, but there is that connection that's very interesting yes yeah. so anyway what were you saying well we that think that my father's alien chip is what he called it um had everything to do with him becoming a genius on the front lines of the emerging computer technology of the age and mm. maybe even how ncr tracked him down to recruit him to ultimately oh, that gives me the chills dayton that does. That's like, I, wow. So they were connected to the ETs at Patterson that said, get this guy and bring him or something. I don't right? know. Right. Wow. Right. Some kind of tracking device, also some kind of downloading device so that he was able to have this advanced computer technology just innate and knowing. 
And then um, here, after I moved to Sedona in 2017, I moved here in 2015, but in 2017, two of my friends, Matthew and Megan, were here visiting my house. And we thought, and they talked a lot about the Arcturians. He claims to have lived near Superstition Mountain and had direct contact with the Arcturians, getting up, going aboard their craft and becoming familiar with an Arcturian named Jazz. I also felt connected to the Arcturians more than any other star race. And so we were having this conversation and I said, well, hey, you know, we've seen a lot of strange lights off my back upper deck here, um, but let's call upon the Arcturians and see if we can have more direct contact. And so the three of us held hands and we set this intention, went out on my back deck. The first thing that happened is the lights on the back deck came on, which you can only do from inside the house. And we were all three of us on the deck and there was no one else inside. And so we wow. thought that was bizarre. What? And then yes. we all felt dizzy. So we grabbed the hand rail. I have motion detectors on the stairwell leading up to the deck. The bottom one went off, the middle one went off, and the upper one went off. As we watched this happen, as if someone was coming up the stairs, but we didn't see anybody. And then the next thing we knew, we were staring at each other going, it's cold, let's go inside. We went inside, we were all disoriented, exhausted, and we were trying to make conversation. And I said, you know what, I'm exhausted. I'm going to bed, I don't know why I'm going to bed at 8.30 at night, but I'm going to bed. I went into the kitchen, looked at my phone and it said 12.40. And then wow, I knew, so but we were exhausted, you... fell into bed. The next day we felt nauseous, disoriented. And I went to a psychic here in Sedona who revealed to me what she saw, which was that these three Arcturians had landed a pod ship, took us each by the hand, took us aboard to, and then we went up to a larger mothership where she says we were downloaded with advanced knowledge, wisdom, technology, what have you to be revealed over time. Within two weeks, I started drawing on poster board circles with 12 circles around it, like a zodiac wheel, but I knew they were dimensions. And then I just downloaded who I was being in each of these dimensions, where I was, and even the role I was playing there. Then I realized I could do it for other people. So, yeah, that's definitely a download experience. And you think also they genetically modified your father so you could be a sort of star seed yourself? Right, definitely. There's got to be a generational connection, right? I think there is a generational connection. You know, um, I just want to say just about National Cash Register is that in 1884, John Henry Patterson bought the these cash register company and renamed it National Cash Register Company. Wow. So the Pattersons owned the cash register company and the Wright Fa Patterson Air Force Base as well. There you go. So and it was called the Wright Patterson because when the Wright brothers came back, they kind of honored them, but it was Patterson which was the base to begin with. And they were all, so I think it sounds like your father was somehow, when was he talking to those German people in German about those plans? What year was that? And so I was born in 1964. We moved to Dayton, Ohio when I was three years old. So let's say 67. And so I'm going to say, 68, 69, 70, you know, we lived in uh, Ohio until I was 14 years old. So we lived there for 10 years. My father worked for NCR until he was 65 years old. The same, but maybe oh no, I'm was sorry, a cover. eight years old. He worked but maybe for that for was a cover years. for. Maybe that was a cover for working at the, I don't know, I don't want to make up stories, but a cover for working with, the Air Force Base, where they took the Roswell 
crap, right, Patterson? Right. And maybe he was part of the reverse engineering team right. that was, because yeah. you said he was into computers. Why did you say that? They didn't even have computers in the 60s, though. Yeah. And so as a kid, he would take me to NCR into these rooms, Alan, that were huge air conditioned rooms with giant computers, you know, all around but the room. But they didn't have computers really, did they? They had Back these the types 60s? of computers when I was a kid that would, that mm -hmm. would release these punch cards Oh, and he right. would like put in a punch card and it would type out on this huge uh, white and green lined paper images. And he would be able to put on the punch card somehow for this, this uh, paper that was spit out to have like mm. the image of Snoopy or something that would light me up. Right. But this oh. is, this is true. These gigantic you know, uh, floor to ceiling size computers. Uh, is he still alive, your father? No, my father passed. <laughs> but, oh, how long uh, ago? Um, how long he passed, ago? Uh -huh, in 2013. And interestingly enough, he was kind of an atheist prior to him getting sick with cancer. And I started to read him the Law of One books. I started to read him Unveiled Mysteries by Godfrey Ray King. Then I gave him the Urantia book. And I mean, he got super interested in Eric Von Daniken's work and um, the gentleman who decides Zachariah Sitchin's work um, mm. and right, became spiritual. Did he, did he think, did he believe he was taken by a UFO back in 54 or wherever that was? He would always ponder this light anomaly and he would try to debunk how it could possibly have been some kind of atmospheric thing but he knew he had this alienship so yeah he doesn't have an he, uh, he didn't have a memory he, he never went to hypnotic regressionist oh he never had this x-ray or anything you know, it was just his truth. And um, he didn't have like a clear recollection of going aboard a craft. So it's all more the experience that followed and the physical, you know, having this chip. Uh -huh. Were you regressed uh, in your Octorian experience? Yes. And so I went to a psychic here who told us about the Arcturian pod ship coming down right, but were you started. actually regressed to the moment where oh regressed you, i'm sorry no i had yes, to, regressed. I, was just I have not been regressed i've been oh. regressed by laurie mcdonald but that was about another experience um and so yeah i should do a regression with laurie you McDonald, should do friend, a regression yeah. because barbara lamb is really yeah. good mary rodwell um there's a lot of really good people out there that are um I was regressed. Actually, I write about my regression in my chapter yeah. in my book. And you know what? Maybe yours is the case. I didn't want to be that my event happened in 87. It wasn't quite missing time, but I felt like we were frozen in time. Me and this girlfriend sleeping on the side of the road in my van on a cross country trip. And I never felt like I wanted to investigate that until like, it was like 2015, like 30 something years later. I mean, I never forgot that moment, but I, it, it was obviously traumatic for a reason, right? I mean, it's, we, we block it out because we, it's so odd that it doesn't integrate with what we know of the world, but as the world starts to unfold, I think these memories will come more online somehow, be more integrated into our uh, oh, um, present day consciousness, let's say. Because, right? I mean, you had this incredible experience with Octorians. Don't you want to know what happens? Yes, right? right? And so with the experiential side of it, the first time I went into Crystal Magic here in Sedona, um, wow. 
I, I was already having this experience of like going into a bookstore and I would, I'd just be driving, not even planning to go to the bookstore. And my car would like end up in the parking lot and I'd walk in directly to some shelf and the book literally looked as if it would illuminate, pull, you know, and kind of push itself out and I would grab it and say, this is it. I'd go to the cash register, buy it and walk out the door. It was like, I was going through this period of these are the books you need in order to continue on your journey. And right. so I was in Crystal Magic and um, this Tom Kenyon's Arcturian Anthology, same thing. It I like love Tom Kenyon, what a great guy. <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. I pulled it out and I was just fascinated. I'd heard of the Pleiadians, of course, the Orions and the different Assyrians and such. But when I saw Arcturian, I was like, whoa, that's it. I need to know everything I can about the Arcturians. And then to have that- you know, when he brings, Yes, I was just gonna say, when Tom brings through the Arcturians in like a live thing, it just knocks me out. I am just like, it go into such a deep state of altered consciousness and so restful and peaceful. So right. that's sort of happened. But what were you gonna say? I think I cut Well, it's the experiential, about. just like my father, it's the experiences that followed with my ability to suddenly download in a moment who I was being in all these different dimensions and then being able to sit in a trance state in meditation and become who I was in these different dimensions. And then my sister came to visit and she was like, do me, do me, do me. And I was like, well, I don't know. And I sat down and it just boom, came through. Now I was going to talk about this at a cosmic awakening event back in 2017. Mm -hmm. And the morning of the talk, I woke up at dawn and it was as if I was shown in holograms that this is so much more than a soul reunion, Suzanne. When you merge people with the higher dimensional aspects of themselves, it is igniting dormant DNA in that person yes. bringing more of their brain online, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you for that. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's what is evolving us, the DNA. That's why the species itself of humans is changing as we interact, as we start making contact. We are making contact really with ourselves, <laughs> with more of ourselves. Right, yes, and, absolutely. And that's the thing. But going back to your experience of missing time, I think there's still a piece in there when you make it conscious, will just then light up all the chakras and, and activate even more. I'm gonna reach out to Barbara Lamb. I can't tell you how many times I've thought about that. Just go on, email Barbara. I'm good friends with Mary Rodwell. I've interviewed her multiple times and seen Mary's her. Mary's great and she's in the book, Mary, right? Yes, you she know, sure is. So maybe I'll just reach out but, to Mary in Australia. Well, but Barbara's great too. Barbara and Mary, and there's some other people out there. Yvonne Smith is great. Yeah, yeah. So, another friend of mine. But you know, I wasn't ready for for that upgrade. To me, uh, it took me it took me like 30 years to get ready for for that. But I think I would not have written this book if I didn't go through that connection. I think there's more for me to connect there. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm always curious why, you know, I'm really into it, but why there's still something traumatic to the human being, our, you know, limited personality self, which is not really who we are, but it's who we, then, you know, the persona, the mask, this is the Greek word for mask is persona that we walk around with that we're trying to integrate. So one of my favorite people is Whitley Strieber, who's developed a process of lucidity. So the more lucid you are in altered states, I don't mean just drug states, but in dream states or in, then the more I think we can meet these beings on this even playing field. 
Did you read the chapter by um, Daryl Anka in there? Who channels ba uh, Bashar. Bash Bashar. Uh, right. Yeah, in that chapter, he asked Bashar, oh, I want to love to meet you. And so Bashar shows up in a dream, which is, you know, more than a dream. And Daryl's approaching Bashar in a ship. And he says, Daryl says in the book, it felt like every sense of his own identity was being ripped apart and he couldn't get any closer to Bashar. He had to, had to retreat because it was the, the presence of those consciousnesses are so vast that, that our little humanness is dissolved not who we are because we are equal to them on a soul level but the identification of persona and the identification with what we think the self is 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 overwhelmed so really making contact is becoming lucid as lucid as we can in dream states it's a good place to practice in in meeting people who've passed over, you know, being aware of who's around us, you know, like some great mediums are, they've just have less filter and they're more lucid. And, and, and how nature talks to us, how our animals talk to us, how the psychic realms are impinging in a good way on our awareness, but we're so limited and I teach remote viewing to exactly do this. I say, okay, I have a target. What is it? And when you can get out of the way of the personality, the target comes, boom, right into your head. And that's how I teach remote viewing. You should take my next remote viewing class. I'll, I'll gift you that. Oh, it's thank be on you. I'd love to, Alan. Yes, because people are natural remote viewers. We have a natural facility to get out of the way, step aside from the personality and just be empty and receive the signal that is hitting us, that's impacting us. So it's interesting. We are so much more of, in our, of consciousness. Consciousness is so much greater than what, you know, the media tells us, our religions, our education, our, uh, our people that think they're in the know and you know there's so much more applications to the, the consciousness that we actually are that that's where we're moving to as an awakened civilization i mean i'm working on that i'm i'm have you know we all have a lot to work on because we've been so warped and distorted and programmed and conditioned and brainwashed as children that um, this whole other reality has been like shielded from us intentionally or maybe unintentionally, but it's, we're not using the full capacity of our awareness and we can, and we can, you know, there's a, there's a talk by Jane Roberts, you know, Jane Roberts, the set sure, material. Sussex, yeah. I actually have a clip, the only video ever taken of Jane, she talks about, these ran I should show that to you. You want to see that? Yeah, sure. Well, we can do that. Okay, this is just the intro. You may find yourself with a random thought that does not seem uh, to fit in with what you are doing or thinking at the time, and so you dismiss it. It seems uh, random because it does not appear to fit in uh, with your organized picture of reality, but it is an important mosaic that you throw away. So I also joyfully and playfully and creatively challenge each of you to become more and more aware of your waking experience and of those stray thoughts that come in your terms like thieves in the night. They are not official. You do not accept them. The intellect says, oh, no. Listen. 
to those thoughts. Open your mind uh, and make further in your ordinary waking life, in the middle of your ordinary pursuits, and uh, see what miracles are there. And I say miracles. Miracles because they can help us transform uh, your own understanding and your own reality. Be gentle with your own experience. The fields of your own beings are filled with flowers that you do not recognize. You do not stop to look at them or smell their odors. They are not official flowers or official food. Sometimes you try to be too practical. You have lovely eyes. Those eyes do not try to be practical. They see out of the joy of their being. They do not hustle themselves. They see together and in being themselves they see uh, for you the reality of the atoms and molecules uh, that exist within the eye. That vision uh, is far different. And yet there is no uh, disagreement between your official reality and uh, those uh, unofficial realities that sometimes sneak. So. Isn't that interesting? Really interesting. Isn't that like a great little piece of of spiritual history right there? There was that was the only video ever. That was from 1974. My friend Harold Channer went up to Elmira, New York, and he didn't even believe in any of this stuff, but he documented that. I thought that little piece really illustrates what we're talking about this next level of reality that we have to help make ourselves aware of you know yeah the, wasn't that great wasn't that great thank like, you for sharing that i'm still kind of stunned i've never <laughs> seen jane roberts on video before of course her book says speaks is famous and one of the first books mm -hmm. i read when i really started to dive in deeper and I love channeled material, Alan. I feel I that the channeled, I mean, I've got, you know, 500 books here in my massive library. And the channeled material to me is the most sophisticated, advanced revelations of truth. I know that's where I started this whole thing with channeling with Ramtha the Enlightened One. Do you know Ramtha? I do have a couple books by Ramtha, yes. That's how I began this whole kind of investigation really? into the unknown. <laughs> yes. Yes, it was very, very interesting. So anyway, let's get back to the book. Didn't let's do it. Side. Right. And so I want to talk more about what Linda Moulton Howe had to say, our mutual oh. friend, Linda. And I always love her insight. She's the best. She is the top investigator in the whole field of ufology, in a field that's probably 95% men, she is the woman that is at the top of the game. She really is. She is one of the smartest people you know. She remembers everything. And she, people, op government insiders open up to her. So this chapter in Making Contact is where part of it is where this DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, whistleblower comes and talks to her about the three competing extraterrestrial races that are fighting for control of the earth. I mean, 
maybe i mean i mean it seems pretty amazing but that's just another aspect of um this unconsciousness that we you know we go around with our kind of normal life not suspecting these other beings might actually be manipulating our reality and look at what we've been through the last you know two years definitely seems like something strange is going on i mean i'm not a conspiracy person but there's definitely something strange about this whole lockdown um, you know i don't want to say much more because i don't know but it's not normal it's not a normal thing i i don't know something something just seems weird about it <laughs> right when it first started to come about and i'm with you i i like to stick to more disclosure you know things yes. that have some factual evidence and i'm not yes. you know go, going down the rabbit hole of course we're both really focused on bringing in the spiritual side of things as well mm -hmm. but um when it first started to come about i went into some meditations and started to explore whether there was an involvement from a cosmic source. And what I found had to do with this comet called Atlas C-19. And I kid you not. I and never heard it, of that. I know. What so I have mean? a video about it. I'll, I, I'll, it's on SciSpy.tv. Um, I had wow. a whole COVID series going with everybody tuning in with different amazing insights. That you know, anyways. But the one, the one of the videos I made because it just came to me that it might have something to do with this with a comet because I felt there was a cosmic connection, and then I. I discovered this comet Atlas C-19. And just the fact that it was like COVID-19 and the C-19 just kind of struck me. And then wow. I started to discover this amazing thing about how when, co when comets pass through our atmosphere, they shower us with some kind of stardust. And the appearance like radiation type of thing it doesn't specifically say radiation but somehow this stardust affects us and if you trace comets coming into our atmosphere over the past several decades every time one comes close something happens that is earth shattering it so there could have been like now. a virus even on that comet do you think right because it's like when you find a meteorite it has living bacteria or living organisms in it right and this is a right. living organism and i'm not saying that you know we got this virus from, but I'm saying there's multiple possibilities about the purpose. So that's a real, I haven't heard that one before, but do you think the government then knew about that? That aspect of I'm the I'm sure, right? I can't be the only one who, but I tell you what, it hit the social media and it was like a lead balloon no one thought it was interesting information it went I think nowhere it's very and i'm like interesting. this is like no, i think it's i think you thing. might be you're <laughs> on to something because i do think comets and cosmic like because must be radio forms of radiation do amplify our dna potential i think it's what and is so one do of the viruses. sources of evolution what? right retro it's so do viruses. Yes. And so yes. when I was reading, then because I did, I was doing this whole T, this whole radio series I, on Truth Frequency Radio. Um, I have a show, Transcend the Matrix, and I was doing this whole series on COVID. And I was looking at it as, you know, you got the malevolent side, which may have been, you know, you this, you know, bat virus that was then made to be cross species in this lab in Wuhan and this whole Soros Fauci's Gates 
CDC WHO involvement, which I think has a lot of validity. And that's like mm -hmm. the malevolent side, but this is a reality of duality. And I'm wondering if there might be a benevolent side to this because we know all the positive effects it's had on awakening people en masse around the world. And so what if, like you're saying radiation or what if it's a living organism, but, I saw this funny thing that they would say in China. Um, if, say, a young child got sick with a virus, the grandmother would say, well, don't worry, he'll be smarter afterwards. And I was like, oh. whoa, right? Because in response to a viral infection, your DNA is upgraded to... Uh, fight that uh, virus, and it may be upgraded in more ways that we know. Uh, we also know we're being bombarded with these uh, solar flares, right? right? I mean, the Chinese uh, also used to say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, you know, because there is, has been a lot of tragedy along with the virus. Oh, I mean, right. But, you know, I do think when people also say radiation from... You know, I think mostly it's the human made, the man made radiation that is very destructive. But I think cosmic radiation coming from the center of the galaxy, even even solar flares can be upgrades to the DNA. I think they're actually the engines of genetic change and maybe the beings that have more fragile DNA like ants and beetles there's so many varieties of that with a little solar blast makes those those little insects shift from one species to another from one type to another because no one can really explain i've written up a paper which maybe i'll bring into a book speciesization how one species becomes another species. It's not through Darwinian theories of adaptations. Yes, you'll get a, you know, a, a thicker coat if you're, a, you know, a polar bear. I mean, there are, there are those adaptive changes, but no one says, okay, how does a, a, a dog become a bear, become a cat. I mean, where are those huge changes? All they say it's punctuated um, evolution, but there's there's no engine of evolution except for what I see and what I've come up with is cosmic, some sort of radiation from the cosmos. So Definitely. that's why we are going through another upgrade to the species. Yes. Absolutely. I think that these yeah. radiations that's coming from, like you said, the great central sun through our own central sun are contain supercharged encoded photons of light, right? They carry information. Information is carried on light. I mean, we know this with our own communication systems, right? Fiber optics, information carried on light from these different hubs that send information at the speed of light through fiber optic cables, right? It's the same idea that these photons carry information, advanced information to upgrade us and also to raise our light quotient. And so we know radiation mutates species, like you're saying. And so, yes, mm -hmm. there can be, again, the dark side of it, but in duality, you have the light side where it may be mutating our being into a higher version. Right, the mutation, yes, I think so. I think that is, and the light is activating the light potential in our DNA, which is the ascension process, you know? You know, it's strange. People aren't talking about Ascension the way they used to in the 80s right. and 90s. You remember everyone had a little Ascension workshop going on. I mean, still some people talking about it, but I think that will come back as we kind of go through this little eye of the storm. And um, because I think the light potential will increase because of what we've been through. Yes. Right. And we know biophotonics 
right? This language of light within our being, mm -hmm. how our DNA yeah. emits and absorbs light. And so yes. our DNA absorbs light. So what if it's absorbing this supercharged encoded photons of light and upgrading our DNA? We are spot you on know, on the same page on this. <laughs> exactly. You know, people who uh, enlightenment light was the emanations around these evolved beings. They would actually admit light or halos, you know, saints and higher beings would emanate a light presence, the building of the light body. This is what the Tibetans called the rainbow body or in the Toltec traditions, if you read the Carlos Castaneda books, he talks about burning from a fire from within. You're igniting the, the potentiality of biophotonic material. So we become these ascended beings, but only after we finish our karmic cycles, only after we finish the, the density of human interactions. And this is, I think, part of why these beings, these ETs are here making contact is because we're reaching the end of a cycle, the end of an evolutionary cycle, an end of a really, Bashar says, this is your last chance for density. Get as dense as you can because we're leaving the dense plane. We're leaving all those petty little human dramatic you know, emotional things that keep people stuck in their old ways of thinking, which is fine if people want to be there, but, you know, it's, it's a process, you know, but transcending the dramas into true feeling is the shift, part of the shift. Definitely. And why the spiritual path has been so beneficial. Yeah. Right, because you it, do. It is. It is the path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is where the ETs and the spirituality and all that kind of connect because uh, our, we are consciously linked to those other beings because there's only one consciousness. So if we are miserable and out of harmony, it's not good for the rest of the cosmos, I think. Right, exactly. We're all interconnected, and so we should take some accountability and responsibility well, for yeah. what thoughts and energy we're sending across the field. <laughs> well, it's like here we are with this kind of uh, primitive way of thinking and war and violence and you know hatred and prejudice. It's like for the rest of consciousness that wants to live in harmony, we're like a little splinter in your little finger, but you know how much that can upset the whole body. You got this little, that's all you're focused on. Get that splinter out and let's get back in harmony. Where are the splinters, Suzanne? Where are the splinters? Great analogy, <laughs> Alan, I love it. <laughs> it just, that's what came to me. It's like, what is this like if we're all connected? And that, that's, I'll take credit for that because it was mine, yes. Yes, <laughs> it was very good. So, it affects the whole, so when, <laughs> even if it is just a little We splinter. get the splinter <laughs> out, we will start to move into harmony with the rest mm -hmm. of creation, which is our destiny, which is what Bruce Lipton says at the end of my book in one of my interviews. You know, I inter Bruce is one of the best, isn't he? He's brilliant. Yeah. He's, he says... We are one consciousness, humanity, but until we know that we're all connected, we're not humanity. Humanity only exists as a being when everyone knows we are part of that being, you know, where we come together as a oneness. He says, and when we come together as a oneness, which forms the bigger being, humanity, that's when we'll openly have contact with the other ones, you know? That's where we're working on this synergy of awareness, this oneness of creation. Yes. So. That's so beautifully said. Now, what do you think about this idea that everyone's on their own journey? Everyone's at a different place in their consciousness evolution. And mm -hmm. some aren't ready 
to ascend into a higher dimensional experience. They're not done mm -hmm. learning their lessons in the 3D realm right. of duality. And it's no judgment. Right. It's just, they still have lessons to learn. They came here. This is a special reality in which you can experience right. duality. And it's so- a, <laughs> It's a schoolhouse. Some people are not finished with first grade. Other people are ready to graduate. It's not a judgment. Right. It's like, right. how many classes did you have to take? I mean, how many, we maybe had more evolutionary time in as incarnational beings to learn those other, more miserable, hard lessons that are very, you know, painful. But maybe part of the process of getting off the wheel of incarnation is to own those experiences, own the suffering, go to the depths of it if you if you can, and and be. It's not easy, but be at peace with that, and you then get off that karmic cycle because the karma is created to learn the human experience and then when you've owned that that starts to quicken the biophotonic nature in the cellular structure to illuminate the rest of the manifest being and that's the so. other purpose of suffering is awakening and i talk about a concept mm -hmm. called awakening from suffering do you like how this yeah. light's going on and off in my office every time we start to come into a big truth? Yeah. Doesn't that, <laughs> does that happen usually? I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with my light. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with them. You're getting signals. <laughs> I'm wondering. We come into this big revelation and all of a sudden the light starts flashing. It's like, yes, you hit upon it. That's that, true. <laughs> that's what's happening in our bodies. You come upon this revelation, the light starts to flash in your body. Right? I think so. Yes, and so awakening from suffering, right? And I always say the dark night is a great gift. And most of us who have plunged into a classic dark night of the soul, we emerged into a light that was bigger and brighter than ever before and may have inspired us to seek spirituality, a deeper meaning and purpose to life. And I think this is something that COVID has done and one of the purposes maybe from a bigger picture of things is people may not wake up until they, have, until they suffer and then they wake up because they have to be shaken out of their routines, right? Everything's going along, yeah. you know, seemingly, and they wake up and go to work and come home and have dinner and wake up and go, to, you know what I mean? But when their routines are disrupted, they're shaken to their core, it wakes people up. It does. It does. Exactly. So the book is about waking people up to these other realities and these beings are waiting for us to wake up, get the splinter out of their finger and <laughs> come into peace, oneness, wholeness. Definitely, so, right? Glad. And connecting with yes. these advanced intelligences advance our knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And right. so are there well, any other uh, essays in the book that you want to talk about before we wrap up yes. our discussion today? One really key essay for me was John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist. Yes. He had died 20 years ago, but he left this unpublished essay. It was a talk, it was a lecture he gave, but he also converted it into an essay that was never put in a book. So I asked to see if I can publish it. And it still reads so much as if it was written today. And John is so important. John Mack is so important because he says these people having experiences are not crazy. He looked at it from a psychiatric point of view. He says they're probably more sane than most people because they've awakened to this other realm. And he was a very spiritual guy. His last book was called Passport to the Cosmos. So John's inclusion in this book validates the stories of contact psychologically, psychiatrically, from a worldview and you know he worked with Danny Sheehan who's 
you know, Nally, a lawyer for Luis Elizondo. Did you know that the guy who's coming forward with the bliss with the disclosure in the government? So that's an important essay. Um, Whitley Strieber, um, JJ Hurtock, and you know JJ and Desiree. Ah, uh, his they're books real are so phenomenal. Made a yes, powerful, profound they difference. Always, they're always trying to bridge the science, the spirituality and these other cosmologies. So mm -hmm. that's a key factor. And Carolyn Corey, who's one of my friends, she talks about merging with these beings. It's the merging of conscious, of, of energies and consciousness. So it's all, I think there's something in there for everyone. It goes levels and levels and levels into the deeper realms until you merge with the ETs. It's sort of an initiation, the book, I think. Mm. Yes. Well, thank yes. you for diving so deep into mm. the thank you for greater your beautiful meaning. Question. Yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for tuning in to my interview with Alan Steinfeld, author of Making Contact, available on Amazon. Thanks for tuning in to Contacty on the Angels, Aliens, and Masters channel of SciSpy.tv.